Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Before we start, I would like to draw your attention to my weekly email newsletter, Friday Focus. Each Friday, I focus on one topic with one action arising. The link to sign up is in the show notes or head over to amyrolinson.com and sign up right now. Today on Focus on Why, I am joined by Barbara Moynihan. Welcome. How are you? I'm very good. Yourself, Amy? Oh, not too bad. Not too bad at all. My St. Granville. So what is it that you're doing at the moment, Barbara? Where are you calling from for a start? I am calling from rainy Dublin. Oh, yeah. I know it's it's rainy, but it's really warm compared to the, the weather that we've had. So yeah, I, I live about 10 kilometres south of the city and about a kilometre in from the sea. So I'm in a very nice place. Brilliant. What a lovely place of the world. Amazing. So what is it that you're up to? So I am running my company on your feet. Uh, busy, busy, busy. I'm trying to probably like everybody get the right life work balance. I always like to put the life before the work, not the other way around. Um, so, yeah, we've just had our busiest quarter in 13 years, which is kind of amazing. And you said busy, busy, busy. And I and I gotta pick up on this as a, a badge of honor that we tend to use as a as a phrase. And but then you did sort of then couple it with this life work balance. So how does that even work in one sentence? True. Well, I I suppose over the last few years, and for the first 10 years, I would have been busy, 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 run, you know, building the business. If anybody asked me if I was busy, if I wasn't particularly busy at the time. I'd always say I'm busy getting busy, which basically translated into I don't have much work on, but I'm working really hard to get work. But over the last few years, I just have had a real realization like, why am I killing myself? Apart from the obvious, obviously, you want to be successful. You want to have enough to live the life that you want to live. But I've just become more and more aware of, yeah, I suppose not life life being more important than the work so actually this year actually I've just finished a blog which I'm going to post mm, probably later on this week about the fact that I took a full month off in January I did not send one email I did not speak to one client I did not run a single program myself obviously my colleagues because there's a few of us in the business they ran programs they they did all the other bits but I literally yeah, I totally switched off and it was absolutely beautiful. And it's really interesting, isn't it? Because you you, you talked about the, I love the, the way that you discerned the difference of the speak of busy. What is the speak of busy? Well, I'm either busy building. I'm also trying to get work in. Clearly now having had the busiest quarter of 13 years, that month was probably in January, not directly affecting the last couple of months. It has been the, the preamble to that but before. So you might have the knock on effect later this year of of what January meant for you from that perspective of taking time off. But you said you totally switched off. Mm. And then now straight into this. Back on your feet again. Yeah. Back. Yeah. And it, it kind of comes in waves. So with, with our business, we're actually quite lucky that January is very quiet for sales. You know, and probably one of the, I wouldn't be a natural salesperson. I, I'd actually, I, I usually use the, the term helping people to make the right buying decision as opposed to saying that I, I you know, obviously part of my role as the MD of the company is, is getting those clients in the door. But um, January for that for us is quiet. Because if you think about it, people are, are on off for Christmas. First two weeks in January, they're only getting back in. Certainly training is not high on their priority. So it's really kind of towards the end of week three that they start thinking about, oh, we must do something 
you know, get 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 moving. And then by the time the meetings happen, it's actually the beginning of February. And my colleague, Sharon, who does all the operational end of things, has all that set up. And then in terms of delivery, my two other facilitators are doing the delivery. So January is quiet. February is really busy. It'll be busy now, probably up until the end of June. And then July and August will be really quiet. So I typically work four days a week. When I say typically, sometimes it does drift into a Friday. But I do try and never to work at the weekends. Because again, in the beginning, it's, you can just become a habit, can't it? You know, I'll have a little peep in the emails. Ooh, you know, on Saturday morning, or something, then you suddenly find yourself in there doing things that you you shouldn't be doing. So, so yeah, I, I, I'm just kind of aiming for more life and trying to not be as focused on the business as I had, but in a positive way. And you mentioned that the the question that you challenge yourself with is why am I killing myself? Mm. And and it is that, let's go to that question. You know, what is the why? Well, for me, why I'm doing what I'm doing is that, as, yeah, I just love helping people. I always have. It's always been in my nature. But in this role, I'm helping people. The goal is just to help them in a very simple way to speak at, to their best capability. So it's not that I want everybody, you know, to turn into motivation speakers or whatever, just to for their role in their organization, for themselves to be able to stand up or sit in the case of the virtual world and say what they want to say. In a way that makes people listen, but not like I had a lady last week, a really interesting woman. She's a GP, a general practitioner, like a, a doctor, and she's got a particular focus on a particular area of women's health but absolutely petrified of speaking in public and when you when you speak to a one-on-one -on -one, so confident so competent so capable and she's been asked to speak at a few conferences and now that she's got this particular niche for women's health like I'm saying to her you have to get that you have to be standing up there and speaking like it it behoves you you're doing yourself and you're you're offering a disservice by not doing it. But it, it's it's interesting how she's so brilliant in other areas and 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 probably a perfectionist. So I'm saying to her, you know, you only need to be good enough that when you speak at a conference, people will get your message. You don't have to be the best speaker at that conference. You just need to get up there and get your message across and feel comfortable. And I think obviously, you know, if she's a doctor, I don't know about in the UK, but certainly here in Ireland, if you want to do medicine, you need virtually top grade in every single subject that you do in your leave insert, the equivalent of your A-levels. So obviously a very high achiever. The exam, you know, the exams are obviously really, really difficult. They're, they're challenging. So, and obviously if you're a doctor and you're doing a diagnosis, kind of has to be perfect are as close to but not when you're public speaking. So I think people who are really perfectionist, it can really go against them. So, so my job is to help her understand, just accept she's not going to be probably an amazing speaker, but she's going to be good enough to get her message out. And that needs to be good enough for her. And I love that message because so often picks in the procrastination of not actually approaching or addressing this issue because you're so focused on, oh, it needs to be perfect. So I can't do that now. So I won't do it at all. And then, but when you spin it round and you said that she has this role and this, this position that needs to, with a message that needs to be heard, it's not about her. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And she says, oh, you know, because I try, like, I studied the psychology of interpersonal communications years ago. And I try and understand when people say I'm terrified, I try and, and not that I, you know, not that I'm a psychotherapist or anything, because I'm not. And if people come to me and they have a real block, I actually have somebody I refer them to because that's not my area of expertise. But I do try and ask them, like, what's behind this? Like, what, what, what are you afraid of? 
And she's saying, because they're all sitting there judging me. Do you know? And they're they're my peers. You know, I know they'd be looking at me and they're going, my gosh, she's so bad at public speaking. And I'm kind of going, how do you know that for a fact? Do you know what I mean? It's It's kind of... Putting her maybe thoughts and actions into their minds, which I'm not sure is is accurate. Like if her message is interesting enough, they're not going to be focusing on her vocal variety, her pausing. Now, obviously, I coach her and all of that, but I think she thinks that they'll be judging her, like you know, dancing on ice or something. Which it's it's not. It's about getting the message out. And the judgment that we have, yes, it's it's part of being human. You know, we do we do make judgment, but we're also looking to to grow, to learn, to see what it is that we can take away to apply to our own world. So yes, she's right. You know, there there is an element of that they may be judging her for what she has to say and maybe in the delivery too. But all of that is forgotten when people take something of value away from that talk, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And she has a brilliant message to share. Yeah. And she will share it. I guarantee you the next conference she's asked to speak at, we've already got one lined up for her. She said yes. So that will happen. But this in your nature, Barbara, of the desire to help people, and you said it's just always been there. It's something that is almost inbuilt. Yeah. What what would it be if it wasn't that? Hmm. What would it be if it wasn't that? Do you mean in terms of what I would be doing for my, in terms of a business role or what? To, yeah, what? I mean, it, because this has been a, a route for you in terms of helping people. That's what I want. That's what I'm doing. That's who I am. I help people. And I'm just wondering to sort of dig under that. If it, if that wasn't there, what what would be there? Hmm. That's an interesting question, which you can tell by my delayed response that I've never thought about. If I wasn't doing what I'm doing now, I would like to be doing something in the health and fitness area. Yeah, I like I like to personally, you know, the way they say if you make your passion, your what's that word thing? If you're profession. You're, you're fresh and you never have to work a day in your life. So when I'm not working, I do love getting outside, getting on my bicycle. I like to do some of the, you know, not heavy weights, but just, you know, little upper body fitness and all those things. So I do like doing them. And sometimes when I look at, so I do these um, online exercises in the morning, probably I could say three mornings a week, but let's be, let's be honest here, probably more like two, one in a bad week. But I look at the girl who's doing it and think, God, I'd love to be doing that because it's so energetic and you can tell she just absolutely loves it. So maybe something like that. I don't know. I suppose I've been involved in training or facilitating or helping people in one way or another for, this is going to make me sound awfully old now, for 30 years. Because prior to being in the communications training, I was an IT trainer. And how I got into that was I had, I, so I used to be in IT. I'd done a bit of programming and that I'd been in. So I was working in a bank in the IT department. And part of my role was working on a new system that was going out into the branch, bank branches. So it was testing it, basically trying to break it so that the programmers could check that everything was working right. So I knew that system inside out. And then I got a role in a, branch and they had just got this new system which was completely new obviously they'd never seen any of the hardware they'd never used any of the the software before and I knew it all inside out and upside down they all got trained but they probably got a couple of hours training so they didn't really know so when I went out people were constantly coming up to me all day asking me how do you do this how do you do that and I found I just got such a kick out of showing them how to do it I decided hmm, I think I'll become an IT trainer so I did. Um, so, yeah, that's how I, I got started. And that's I've been doing it for so long. I kind of can't really imagine doing anything else. But there you go. You've got me thinking about something new. So the, the, the driver behind that. So it sounded like you were in a role 
I don't know how you came about that initial role uh, working in the IT department of the bank. Was it, did you just fall into that or was that a conscious? Oh, that's a you... longer story. So <laughs> I had, I had, so when I left school, I had been working in that same bank for eight years. Then I left it and I went traveling. Then I came back after traveling and ended up in that same bank. But I asked to be moved into IT because I felt I had been working in branches. I just felt I'd like a change from the branches. Started working in the IT, got an interest, then I went off and I did a programming qualification. Then I left the bank again and I went off to Australia for a year. And then when I came back, that's when I ended up back in that bank again in the IT department. That was a very long winded answer. Did it make any sense? Well, it wasn't a long winded answer. It was just a l- big, long time of frame in terms of of the span of of all of that. So, uh, yeah, several years, almost a d- over a decade. Yeah. And, you know, it's, sometimes it's funny that people go, oh, you know, if I leave my job, like I'd be afraid it would damage my career. For both my husband and I, we were both working in companies. We left, went to Australia, came back, both got asked back by our companies and both did really well out of it. So it's funny, people think if I leave, I'll miss out. But sometimes if you leave, you get new experience and they view you now with with new eyes. So I'm I'm a big fan. Actually, it's funny. I was at the vet this morning, as you know, at the veterinary hospital. And um, so that veterinary hospital is attached to a university. So some of the students were sitting in then uh, in on the consultation. And then obviously I was sent off. They did whatever to the dog. He will live just to let you know. But when I came back, one of the students was bringing me back in and I was saying to her, what year are you? And she said, I'm final year. And I said, oh, gosh, that's great. She said, yeah, I'm thinking of going to Australia next year. And I said, go. Like when I ever get an inkling of anybody with a hint of a sniff of a chance of them going traveling, I would always say, just go. You're young. You don't have a mortgage. You will not regret it. And you know what? If it doesn't work out, you can always come back. You know, so I'm a great um, advocate of, yeah getting out there traveling I love that and I, I remember when I I met my husband at university he was doing his mm-hmm. second degree degree and we we had this point where we could either start a family buy the house or go traveling and we made the decision to have the family young at and and then do the traveling after and here we are now all those years down the line 20 years later now like oh we can do that now and yeah. so oh my goodness and because the, the whole world has shifted in the way that we work now I don't have any commitments other than the dog here we go mm. little, the dog he can come with some some of the places but yeah it really has changed and I am with you on on go on an adventure yeah. because when you you said that question earlier, why am I killing myself? It's because of the other life element of that life work balance that is the priority. Yeah, but you know, I think the other thing then is it kind of, and I have this in the blog, I only had a realization a few months ago, it nearly becomes a habit of, you know, yes, of course we all want to work hard. Yes, we want to grow our business, but why are we, maybe working harder than we need to work. And it's probably because we've just always done that, you know? So the why behind the why for you, the helping, the why for helping people, what does that come down to? Why behind, behind the why? Do you know what? It's, um, you get a real feel good factor when you help somebody else and when you do something for somebody else. So this is a role where you're doing it, you're getting to feel good and it's a business. Like even if, like I I just can't help myself. If I see, if I'm walking down the road here and I happen to see a couple of tourists and they've got a map, I can't stop myself. I have to go over and say, you know, do you want to, do you want to hand? A, I want them all to love Ireland and come back. But B, I just, you just get that. I don't know, is it, you probably get, what is it? Um, What's that feel good hormone? The happy hormone? Dopamine, serotonin. They're all of them. You must get a hit of them when you help somebody. I don't know, but yeah, I I do like helping people. Yeah. So the why, why, the why is maybe the dopamine. Yeah. And that's probably where your other energy is 
with the exercising because you also get natural adrenaline, natural dopamine from exercising. Oh my gosh, maybe I'm a dopamine, a dopamine addict. And we all are. The time, taking you to find that in me, Amy. No, we all are. We all are. That's what we live for. Is, is yeah. for those. And yeah. it's really interesting because I've I've done with the purpose comes a lot of research in in the happiness element of what what is it that drives us and absolutely the the altruistic tendencies of of just wanting to help and that's why volunteering is such a big thing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, true. It's on my list to do more of that when I um. When I get more time for myself, when I can start working even less. So what is what are the priorities for you right now, Barbara? Um, priorities, well, to get back to full health. I'm having an, a knee operation in early April, so that will help me to uh, be able to do more of the things that I like to do. To, yeah, to get this, this um, the life work thing under construction control I still I, I'm still not there yet um I think it's yeah constantly working on it you say not there but will it will it naturally shift anyway I don't think it'll naturally you know it'll have to be a conscious shift yeah yeah it'll have to be yeah a conscious shift in terms of sorry what I'm what I meant was is that you say there as though it's a it's a singular destination, but it's it's going to evolve as you change. It's get, so there's never really going to be a there, is there? It's it's going to shift as things change anyway. Uh, true, true. Yeah, yeah. This is true. Yeah, and I suppose as I move on in my career and get older, the there is going to change. Yeah. Mm. So maybe I should be happy, Amy, that I'm not there because I'm never going to get there. Kind of the point. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? It's always that when I get there, then, you know, or if I yeah. do this, then. And it's a case of, hold on, hold on. <laughs> What's happening yeah. now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We put so many conditions on our life, don't we? We do. We do. We do. And like, don't get me wrong. Like, I'm, I, I, it's, it's fairly good and it's a way better than it was when I set up years ago where I'd be working morning, noon and night, I used to, when I set up the business in 2010, I used to network three times a week, every week, like for about 18 months. Like it was, I was at every single thing. I was in so many different networks and now I've just tapered that right back. Um, And with networking, I think one of the things we can do in the beginning is be a busy fool. Oh, I'm out and I'm meeting people and I'm here and there. Um, and I was in different networks. I've always had a business coach. And I remember my coach sitting me down one time and saying, right, so what networks are you in? And I named out, you know, this one and that one and the other one. And she was saying, and how much business do you get from it? I said, I don't really get business, but I really like the people. And she was like, hmm. So on a Tuesday night, would you rather spend time with your family or go to the network? I was thinking, yeah, good point. So I, I left a lot of them and I'm now... I'm now just in one and it's really, it has the combination of really nice people because I think networking is all about going out and chatting to people, but being ready when they ask you what you do, that you can say something that that resonates. But I think it's, you know, my, my biggest learning was when I just relaxed and went to chat to people. That was it as opposed to, I'm ashamed to say in the early days I was going to sell, like how ignorant was I? So really nice people. And also the right people. Yeah, I love that. The right people. Yeah. And what was the thinking behind On Your Feet? So the thinking behind On Your Feet goes back to, so I had been working for nine years for an international training company called Dale Carnegie Training. Then the recession hit. There was very little work. And the franchise owner of Dale Carnegie in Ireland said, look, I've I've no work for myself for the next nine months, let alone for you. So I had to set up my own business because there was no training jobs going in 29, 2010 because of the recession. So I set up on your feet. I came up with the name because... From personal experience, one of the first presentation skills programs I ever went on 
the only person who stood up and spoke was the facilitator. I remember the night before the program thinking, oh my gosh, I was very nervous thinking, oh my gosh, this is going to be so, you know, we'll have to stand up, we'll have to speak. And I was just shocked when none of us, was 12 of us on the program, none of us stood up and spoke except the facilitator. And I thought, how can you speak without getting on your feet? So the on your feet was always in my mind. And then I started to run programs. Uh, I used to, In the first year that I set up, I used to call them Oh, the first one, the kind of like a basic level one was on your feet and on your way. And I think the f- the final one was on your feet and all the way or something. I can't remember it, all these kind of sexy names for them, uh, which wasn't really very good when you really had no clients at that point in time. And then I thought, I wonder if on your feet is available as a domain name, which it was for .ie. And I got that and that was that was it. But even to this day, any of the programs we do, they're very participative because yes you need a certain amount of theory but you learn by doing and there's research to prove that adults learn way better when they are in control of their own learning absolutely I'm just trying to think it I think it was the Dale Cone learning model and it yeah it's all about when you're actively part of yeah of the the learning process yeah you learn by doing but you also learn by being, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm just going to ask you about the influence of being a trainer for the Dale Carnegie training. Yeah. I mean, he, everyone knows the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's probably, yeah, you've got it right, <laughs> right there still. So, I don't know why I have it on the floor. I had it on the floor for some reason. It's usually up there behind me. Yeah. So how to win friends and influence people and how to stop worrying and start living. Yeah, that was the second part that I wanted to pick up on. Okay, just because we've been talking about starting living, and I just wanted to just sort of say how much of the the influence of that training comes in your life and work. An awful lot. It's funny because sometimes people ask me on podcasts, "What's a book that would have influenced you?" That book, "How to Win Friends and Influence People," was. I remember there was one, so for anybody who doesn't know the book, like there's, there's um, each chapter has a story or stories and then there's a principle at the end of each chapter. So for example, the first one is don't criticise, condemn or complain. That's the very first uh, message. But I'll never forget the one which was um, principle 16 and it was try to see things from the other person's point of view. And for me, that was probably the biggest revelation when and and I do try. I don't always succeed, Amy, but I do in any situation when I try and think, particularly when when something is um not as we would like with the person, I kind of think, well, why are they being like, you know, and then I think, oh, hold on a minute. You do not know, you know, if I was them, what would I think? Well, if I was them, they don't know that my dog has just been to the veterinary hospital, that my whole day has been just thrown. They don't know. So if you can honestly put yourself in the other person's point of view, um, I just think it's, it's uh, yeah, for me, that was life changing and other ones in there. So you know, obviously the, the worrying one, I wouldn't be a massive worrier, but there are times when I would um, maybe overthink things. So just using some of those principles, like what's the worst that can happen? It is coming back to some of those really basic principles and, and sometimes, you know, just seeing them written down and you just think, oh gosh, you know, as you said, the principle number one about don't criticizing, it was so easy to, to criticize and and complain. And, and then, yeah. 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 It is. I mean, and uh, some people are better at it than others, you know, that's kind of their constant source of conversation. So you just kind of try and move them along onto something that's a little bit more on the positive side. But yeah, w- working at what's the worst thing that can happen, then accept that and think, okay, what what's within my power to try and avoid that? You know, it's it's fairly basic when you think of it, but actually sometimes in the moment you can't step step back and and do that. But and do you consciously think about your purpose Barbara do you see it as something that's driving you or is it 
just something that you naturally do and you don't give it a huge amount of thought? Yeah, it, it's funny. I because I know we had a good conversation um, when we met at the conference a few years, a few months ago, I should say. I wouldn't really. Well, well I, sometimes I would think, like, what would I like to be on my gravestone? Which I think sometimes feeds into your purpose. Uh, or maybe maybe it's not so much your purpose. It's what you, I suppose, in, in basic terms, it's what you'd like to be remembered for. But no, I, I don't overly think about my purpose, but I do overly think about what others would say about me when I wouldn't be in the room, which I suppose is kind of tying into your brand in a way, which is a classic de- def- definition. But I would think about who am I and what are my my key, um, call them values, call them attributes, whatever. I would think about them more so than my whole purpose. And your core values are? Fairness and fun. Love that. Yeah, I think if people were fair, like I do my utmost to be fair to my team, fair to my clients, fair to myself. Yeah. And and what would you have on your gravestone? Ooh. Would you? <laughs> I tell you, she squeezed the living daylights out of life. <laughs> I love or, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sweet. Yeah, it's just trying to do do the most, and probably that's my downfall because sometimes I do try and do too much. Do you know? Again, it's about balance. Yeah, I'm just all I can think of right now is what Spike Milligan's. <laughs> Goes on his gravestone. I told you I was ill. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> and there's the Gosh. fun element coming in. But yeah, yeah, I do love to squeeze the living daylights out of life. And and it mm-hmm. is that. So I talk all about this all the time about not just filling in the moments, but creating moments that are fulfilling. And it is that case of the message you shared earlier about just go travel if that's what you want to do and, yeah. and, and make that decision and stick with it and know that if it's not right you can come back yeah. you can you know so yes but just pursue it because if you don't pursue it you'll always think oh what if yeah and I think the thing is when you're young you know especially if you're just out of college you haven't started your career or even if you've started your career and you're in a role that's not really fulfilling go do it now because the thing is you know, if you wait another year, then maybe you've got a partner and maybe they don't want to travel or maybe you've decided to buy a property. Well, not in Ireland, I mean, because you couldn't afford it. But but, you know, you've you've kind of got more roots. It's just a bit more tricky to to up and go. So, yeah, like, I mean, when my daughter was saying she was going to London, I was saying, go now, do come back at some stage, but definitely go. And then when the second one was saying she was thinking of going, I said, go. So they're actually living together now in London, which is which is great. But yeah, travel, definitely. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like you learn so much from traveling anyway. Your eyes are opened. Yeah, there's a big wide world out there, everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Waiting to be explored. And we've no excuses now because COVID is long gone. Although we do have to be conscious of our, our footprint, our carbon footprint in the traveling. Well, this is very true. Yeah, this is true. But you could always go on the ferry to Europe and maybe work your way around the world. Actually, a total aside, I'm, I'm reading a brilliant book about an Irish lady who in 1963 decided to cycle from Ireland to India. In 1963, could you imagine? She probably had about three gears on her bike. She's an <laughs> unbelievable woman. Yeah. So if people want to save their carbon footprint, that would be an extreme way of doing it. But I'm sure there's I'm sure there's better ways of doing it. That's brilliant. So Mm -hmm. stop worrying, start living, bring fairness and fun to the world and help people. In a nutshell, you're doing a grand job. There you go. Oh, I like the grand. You're Irishizing. Thank you very much for saying I'm doing a grand job. I'm doing my best. Not perfect, but. And as as we found out earlier, you know, the the perfection is not, it's not a good thing. No. Honestly, it just, um, yeah, I'll often share a quote with people from Marie Curie. So Marie Curie won not one, but two Nobel Prizes, two Nobel Prizes, one with her husband and one by herself and both sciencey ones. One was for penicillin. But she has a, a saying and it's have no fear of perfection 
because you'll never reach it. Have no fear of perfection because you'll never reach it. And there's somebody who got two Nobel Prizes. Perfection is uh, not good, you know, to aim for a second. Who says, like when somebody says they want to give the perfect presentation. Well, what is perfect? Your perfect might be different than my perfect, than different than somebody else's perfect. So all you want to do is do your best. And with that, how would people reach out to you, Barbara? They can get me uh, on the website on your feet dot ie or through linkedin barbara moynihan perfect both those links will go into the show notes so it's easy to find you fabulous thank you for coming on focus on why i've really enjoyed our conversation and and the 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 chat around so many different areas it's been really interesting with talking about how you're doing what you're doing and how it's been such an impactful way for you but also just shaping the lives of others it's it's fabulous knowing that the messages of others will be heard with your work is a phenomenal gift to to yourself and to and to the world so thank you it's it's wonderful have you got some final words for the audience please final words yeah i i look just don't focus on perfection focus on doing How has this conversation had an impact on you? What value have you received from tuning in? What are your reflections with actions? Please take a moment to leave me an Apple podcast or Spotify review sharing how Focus on Why has made a difference to you today. Remember, the conversation doesn't end here. To keep it going, simply connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook or Twitter or join the Focus on Why Facebook group. All the links are in the show notes. Have a purpose, have a plan, Focus on Why.